So of the four types of malware we're going to talk about in this video, the first one, and the one that's probably along with backdoor is the most common, as far as effectiveness, most common attempted, is going to be the Trojan. And the Trojan is simply put some malicious code hidden inside some non-malicious code. So here you can see this example of a word processor application that has some malicious code hidden somewhere inside of it. Now the word processor isn't a mock-up necessarily. It might be a fully functional word processor. It might be some freeware utility. It might be something you actually craft up, or it might be something vertical to the enterprise. So maybe if it's an accounting firm that you're doing this testing on, maybe it's a cute little calculator that automates some of the processes that they need. Whatever it is, it's some legitimate code, some non-malicious code that hides a malicious piece of code the attack code, the code that you're looking to do something with. And I'll go over the component names in just a moment. But at its root, it is a combination of bits of code, non-malicious and malicious code. And the malicious code, certainly if you just sent malicious code to users, they probably wouldn't execute it. Or if they did, they would be crazy. But the non-malicious code is functional and useful enough to tempt people. And if you just sent the non-malicious code Without the malicious code, it wouldn't be a Trojan, but people would find function and use in it and actually run it. Oftentimes, that non-malicious code is what gets you through the malware defenses and what gets the Trojan to the clients or to the servers and gets it to be run. And it also tempts the users. So they, they will certainly want to run this Trojan, whether it's a game or a word processor or a calculator, whatever it is. So it's this combination of functionality and attack that's really the key for Trojans. In a Trojan, the attacker certainly is going to be you or me or the ethical hacker, if you will. The payload is the malicious code. The dropper is this component that installs the payload. And the wrapper is the component that actually looks innocent. For example, our word processor. The word processor wraps the dropper and wraps the payload such that the dropper can install the payload. The interesting aspect here is that the dropper essentially is a disposable piece of code. It runs, installs malicious code, and then goes away, self-destructs or evaporates or simply doesn't run ever again, just runs once. The dropper is the interesting bit because it's what helps a Trojan evade detection and evade, uh, evade any kind of the countermeasures that are out there because the dropper changes all the time. Consider that if you build maybe 10 different versions of the same Trojan, you can actually use the same wrapper, the same legitimate code, the same payload, same malicious code, and 10 different droppers or variants of droppers. Those are going to look like 10 totally different things to most countermeasure implementations. And out of 10, maybe two will get through, maybe five will get through, maybe all 10 will get through because there's no consistent, predictable, and definable pattern. So the countermeasure may actually have trouble finding this at all. There's little limitation, if any, to the type of payloads that a Trojan can carry. Anything from a command shell to a proxy server to a botnet uh, to a spam server to an FTP server to a network sniffer, Virtually any kind of malicious code will run as a Trojan or will get deployed and installed as a Trojan payload. So the limitation really is up to you. It's more common to see Trojans deliver something that's running stealthily, not as obvious, not as blatant, because that's part of the elegance is you're trying to sneak something in through the countermeasures and have, actually have it run. So oftentimes this will be some type of remote control or remote monitoring technology, or it'll be some type of remote command shell that you may not use very often, but occasionally you'll sneak in and run a command like adding a user or changing a user's context. Oftentimes Trojans do deliver proxy servers, and you'll learn quite a bit about using proxy servers in attacks during the hijacking video that's coming up in a little bit. But by and large, the only limit really is the type of code that you can install. And and because virtually every type of attack that you can think of has some type of stealthy code, almost anything can get delivered with a Trojan. So at this point, you're saying to yourself, wow, Mike, this sounds pretty cool. How do I do it? How do I actually attack with a Trojan? 
Well, the first thing you need to do is select the payload. What do you want to do with this Trojan? Do you want to have a remote FTP server? Do you want to have remote control of the system? Do you want to have uh, a proxy server installed? That kind of thing. Need to select a payload and be really cautious about which payload you select because you don't want to install all payloads. That's probably the most common mistake I see people make with this is saying, oh, well, I'll just install everything with the same Trojan. Well, that's not really effective because a calculator app that's 35K or 55K uh, that shows up in email as 17 megs because it contains installers for a bunch of different malware or a bunch of different types of functionality, not so cool. You want to be a little bit more elegant with this and certainly build on this attack for later. So if you want to actually compromise a system in a number of different ways, you might want to select a payload that allows you to further attack or build on that attack later, like a remote command shell, something that will actually enable you to commit further attacks, install more software later on. And then selecting the most effective wrapper. This is getting down a lot of it to footprinting and enumeration, understanding the target. So different companies, different individuals, different roles will find different types of useful software least or less threatening and more effective. So as I mentioned earlier, a calculator app that maybe automates a bit of functionality for a specific type of accounting firm, or let's say a simple game for a couple of folks that you maybe footprint and find out they like games or they like to waste time at work. Or for management, you may have some little application that automates a little bit of, of presentation skill or something like that, like a PowerPoint add-on. Any of these kinds of things are appropriate. There's no wrong answer here. It's just you're looking for what is the most effective wrapper? What's the one that's going to tempt users to double-click it, to actually launch it so that the dropper can install the payload and won't set off any alarm bells. They won't think to themselves, well, I double click that app, but instead of getting functionality, I just got a window that said this didn't work. That's not going to help you at all. And that may actually cause some concern for the user. You may think that you actually want to create a dropper and package up the Trojan yourself, but that's actually not a great idea. The dropper has to be really carefully crafted to not set off any malware detection or destroy the system or compromise system integrity while it's actually installing the software that you've selected. So selecting the payload and the wrapper really should be where you focus. And then using something like a Trojan construction kit will help you build the dropper, build the wrapper, wrap it all up into one executable that doesn't look like it's going to get detected by malware uh, detectors, and then deploy it out there. So using a Trojan construction kit, while it does sound a little bit silly, it does sound a little bit like you're taking a shortcut, it's probably the most effective way to build a Trojan that will not get detected and will deliver the payload in a way that it works correctly, that it actually executes and installs the payload that you're looking for. And then deploying the Trojan is really just a simple matter of getting it in front of the right people so that they double click it, whether that's email whether that's some type of social engineering that you'll see in the social engineering video where you drop it on a USB drive and actually put it in a place where people will pick it up and bring it through the firewall or around the detection systems. Whatever it is, uh, there's a million different ways to get an executable to a user, whatever you think is best based on your enumeration and your footprinting work.